All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Shh. Good, good, good. You have a, you have a full house today. You pretty, pretty close to full. I uh, hope everyone's doing okay. My voice is just about better back to normal. The allergies are certainly declining, I think, but uh, my voice is still a little frail, so I'll do my best, and I'll be eating these profusely throughout class. Uh, how's everyone doing? Good? Good. Anything on your mind? Anything you're wondering about? Anything you're querying? No? Okay. <clears throat> So everyone knows, no class on Monday, right? I see, I see, I see. Read the syllabus very far ahead. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's here. I promise. So yeah. So no, no class on Monday. Okay. So go enjoy. Have a nice three day weekend for me, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. And uh, uh, next week we'll be starting a new topic. Shh. We're starting a new topic: marital property, which relates somewhat to current estates, but has a lot of different wrinkles. Okay. Today we're going to finish up one last topic on concurrent estates. Um, any questions before we get started? Okay. So to review, last class we discussed this idea of concurrent estates. So in addition to people having present interests and future interests, you have two or more people who have interests at the same given time. And we discussed this idea of a concurrent estate, which is not really like a roommate, because when you have two people who own a tenant concurrently, they have access to the entire property. They have what's called a separate but undivided interest in the property. Now, the nature of the interest might vary, but the key thing is they each own the entire thing with separate interests. And access cannot be cut off to any part of the property. And we described three different types of concurrent interests. The first one was the joint, I'm sorry, the first one was the tenants in common, right? The tenants in common basically means they each have a separate undivided interest, but they're able to freely alienate it. And when one of them dies, it goes to that person's heirs. In other words, the other tenant does not have a right of survivorship. Next one up the pyramid, so to speak, was the joint tenancy. And the most important aspect of the joint tenancy was there was a right of survivorship. What does that mean? When one of the tenants dies, it goes to the other tenant. This is a very valuable thing, especially in the days before wills, because this allowed for an easy and immediate transfer. So say if you had you know, two brothers living on a piece of property, and they were joint tenants, once one brother died, it would immediately go to the other brother, and there'd be no gap, or there'd be no probate, or any need to go to court for anything. But the joint tenancy has certain stringent requirements, okay? Specifically, at all times, from the point the property is conveyed to the point it's owned, you need to have these four, what are called unities, right? These four unities that must be present. And what are these four unities? Well, first, we have to have the two people take it at the same time. Uh, in other words, they have to acquire at the same time and own at the same time, okay? Second, they have to have the same title. That is, they have to have the same instrument. So they have to both be delivered this piece of property with the same, literally, piece of paper, okay? They have to have the same interest. So if one has fee simple, the other one has fee simple. If one has a life estate, the other has a life estate. The interest must be the same. And the final one, the P, is, remember, TTIP. The final one is possession. They must have a complete access to the entire property, you can't cut anyone out. You can't separate anyone. Okay? Is that a hand? Yeah. I'm around the country. There's a lot of farmland. So is this something you'd see, like, when a farmer dies, like, you'd give his son joint tenancy of, like, the farm? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Okay. Very likely, yes. Um, you have to see how it's deeded, but this is a good way of a father leaving property to his kids in a way that they both own it together. And that they can't do anything to the demerit or the harm of the other one. They were, maybe the father doesn't trust the boys, right? Um... But the rub with the joint tenancy is if at any point one of those four unities is severed, right? If at any point one of the tenants sells his property, right? One of the tenants builds a fence and blocks off uh, access. Uh, one of the tenants does something else which breaks apart one of those four unities. The entire joint tenancy is destroyed and like shoots some ladders. You go down the ladder and then I like, go down the chute and you go to the tenancy in common, right? So you lose that right of survivorship. Um, so there's actually an incentive for both parties not to break the tenancy, the joint tenancy, because that way they don't want to lose their uh, survivorship rights. Okay? Any questions on that? That's why you didn't, didn't say when, like, dealing with a party of three, when they do actually break that, it only affects their relationship, but the other two parties will remain joint and not joint. Yes, and that was that example we did in the last class, which I don't want to repeat. But, but in short, when you have multiple joint tenants, and maybe one of the tenants right. breaks the unity, that's only with respect to him. The 
another two are still joint tenants by themselves, and they retain a right of survivorship. If you don't get what he just asked, go back and look at the example. I think it was an example of two or three. I can't remember what number it was. Go look back at example two or three and review the notes, uh, and then ask me about that again. But that's an important uh, uh, doctrine to get. Okay. Uh, we discussed the final one, which we didn't spend too much time, but we'll do later uh, uh, next week, which was a tenancy by the entirety. And this was a a state, a concurrent estate limited to married people. And it specifically involved the four unities, time, title, interest, possession, plus the fifth unity, which was marriage. And this was really just a way of protecting married couples and making sure that the uh, uh, two parties didn't you know, screw each other over. Um, the only way to sever the tenancy by the entirety was divorce. Uh, if, one of the, if they got divorced, then the tenancy would fall apart, <clears throat> and it would then drop down to a tenancy in common. Okay. We'll do a lot more on marital property next week, so I don't, I don't want too many questions on that now, but there are some somewhat complicated rules uh, in different states depending on the uh, property regime. Uh, we'll study next week community property or common law property. Okay. All right, any questions on that? Okay. So our focus for today is <clears throat> not on the creation of these concurrent estates, but how the parties can manage uh, the relationships amongst themselves. And we start from the premise that these estates are created very deliberately. So, so for example, Jason asked, you know, would a father uh, create a joint tenancy for his two sons who want to inherit a farm in the country? And, and I answered, yeah. Um, these are ways of controlling property after you're dead, right? So one way of doing it is the way we did it in the past. You say, okay, my oldest son has it for his life, and then after my oldest son dies, it goes then to my youngest son, right? Or my oldest son gets to keep it so long as he maintains as a farm, but if it stops being used as a farm, it goes to my youngest son. That's one way of doing it. This way of doing it is saying, listen, I want you guys to use it together at the same time, right? But I'm sure you know, very often, sons don't agree. Uh, if you've ever had a roommate or a spouse or anyone you lived with, uh, you know that very often you probably don't agree on how to use a piece of property. And this can very often lead to various disputes and, and, and problems and fighting. Now, if someone is your roommate, right, you can just move out. You don't have any ongoing claim in it. You're just leasing it for a period of time. But the issue with a joint tenancy or a tenancy in common is that you both own it together. And it becomes very difficult to separate your share from his, right? You can always sell your share, but who's going to buy it, right? Who's going to want to come in and become a joint tenant with your idiot brother, right? Who's going to come in and have to deal with the farming with your brother or your sister, whoever it happens to be? Um, also, it makes it very difficult to alienate the land. And we'll do a case like this later. But say you have an asset and a piece of property. If you owned it yourself, you could put a mortgage on it. You could perhaps build on it. You could do various different things. When you own it jointly with your idiot brother, you're maybe limited. Maybe he might not want you to build a factory on it. Maybe he might not want you to put a mortgage on it. Maybe he might go out of his way to prevent you from doing those things. So that diminishes the value of your property. So these joint tenancies or these tenancies in common have a lot of um, burdens on them that normal fee simple ownership does not have. Okay? But by the same token, when you accept a joint tenancy, you accept it with those terms. Right? So to use, to use an example Jason gave a minute ago, if your father wants to leave you property with your brother in his joint tenancy, say, sorry, Pop, I don't want it. Give it to him. You can do that. Right? Of course, no one actually does that. At the outset, it's like, oh, great. My brother and I will live together in this property. We'll be happy. We'll hold hands and sing kubaya. Yeah, it sounds wonderful at the beginning. But invariably, things go wrong. And when things go wrong, as they will invariably do, courts try to figure out what is the most optimal way of resolving this situation? <clears throat> and generally, courts say, not our problem, right? We don't want to get involved. But if the courts have to get involved, they have two remedies, okay? Uh, the first remedy is called a partition in kind, right? What's a partition in kind? They effectively find a way chop up the land and give one chunk to one tenant and give another chunk to another tenant. Okay. Now, last class, I, I implored you. I said, 
if people are joint tenants in common, do not say they own 50% of the land and they own 50%. I said, don't think like that, right? The only time when courts start thinking like that is when they have to discuss partition and sale or partition and con. You'll notice that we say today, they get fractions. That's right? like 44 out of whatever, 100, whatever it was, I can't remember, right? They get very deliberate fractions. When courts have to start chopping up land, they need to look at these numbers. Okay. But often it's not enough to say, okay, he owns 60% of the land and she owns 40%, right? It's which 60%, which 40%, right? Where do you cut the line? Okay. And sometimes this can be fairly obvious. So, for example, in the case we'll do in a few minutes, the Delphinus case, right? Um, it turned out, oh, Delphino, I'm sorry, that the rubbish hauling station was kind of in the corner. <clears throat> so this was a situation where it's fairly easy to separate. But often it's not. What if people use various bits here, bits there, bits there? How do you consolidate it? Right? What if the terrain is very rocky and mountainy and it's effectively impossible to section a piece off? Okay. If it's really difficult or impossible to partition in kind, you can actually have what's called a sale of the land. So what does that mean? They put the entire lot up for sale to the highest bidder. And then, say the bid gets $100,000, they divide the proceeds based on the ownership percentages. Right? So if there are two of them, more likely than not, they each own 50%. Right? Each would take a 50% cut of the sale. Yeah. So generally speaking, you have those two remedies. You have the partition in kind, or you can order a sale of the land. Neither of them are preferred, and historically, both are very hard to get. The partition in kind is somewhat preferable for the simple reason that courts don't like forcing people to sell their land. Right? People live on land, they work there, they have their businesses or livelihood. Merely giving you the value of your land may not compensate you for the loss of whatever you may have. For example, in this case, she had a garbage uh, hauling business on this land. Right? Merely giving her a sale of the land will not save her business. Yeah. So what you find in the case law is that courts are just very hesitant to award these sales of land. And if needed, and the party simply cannot get along, they turn to a petition and cut. Okay? <clears throat> All right, questions on that? Okay, where did I finish last time? Okay, perfect. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, Mario, so let's talk about the Delfino's case. And by the way, this is actually a case from Bristol, Connecticut. Everyone knows what Bristol's famous for? ESPN. ESPN. I actually Googled it. This is about a mile from the ESPN headquarters. So if she would have held out for like another 15, 20 years, she would have a lot more money. Uh, but, but she died some, some years ago. Okay. So uh, what happened in this case, in the Delfino case, please? All right. So here there was uh, two plaintiffs, and some property, uh, 5.5 acre parcel of land. And the plaintiff's only undivided 99 acres of property. The defendant owned a 25 of 100 acres. The plaintiffs, they wanted to go ahead and uh, move for a partition. And the defendant they wanted a judgment of an in kind partition. So basically, the trial court uh, ruled that a uh, sale would be better than the non-life factors. But the court overruled it and said that the trial court had error. Okay, good. Thank you so much. So, first, First again, so the opinion says that they have these very funny numbers. They have this 99 over 144 and uh, 45 over 144. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they came up with such precise numbers. Um, if I had to guess, there were probably several intermediate transactions preceding them of how these people managed to become um, uh, tenants in common. Um, but it's a very odd number. Okay? So it turns out that on this piece of land, which is a fairly large piece of land. Um, Mrs. Um, <clears throat> Valencias operated a, a rubbish hauling business. Okay? Now, it's not a garbage dump, although some of you may be tempted to call it that. She didn't actually um, maintain garbage on this plot. 
She had various trucks which would come and bring garbage and dump it off and remove it and come and go. So this was almost like a um, like like a way station where they would keep these trucks and bring uh, various rubbish hauling off. Okay. Uh, the Delfinos, they had no interest in being a joint tenant, but they're in fact they didn't actually live on this piece of land. So they wanted to order a sale of the entire uh, area. Uh, Valencia said, no, don't sell it. Give me my portion. You can cut it off. And then you can transfer um, the rest to them. Now, this does not look like 45 out of 144. The numbers don't match up. And I've taught this case a number of times. I don't know how these numbers match up. But this is the diagram the manual, teacher manual provides. So I'm going to go with it. So pretend the numbers aren't accurate. I, 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 don't, I have no idea how these numbers match up, but we'll just pretend they are, okay? And I did a Google map, and it is still houses in that area, so I don't, I don't know exactly what happened there. Okay? All right, so they go to the trial court, right? And, and I think uh, uh, Myra said it correct. The trial court ordered a partition and sale, right? John, why did why the trial court take partition by a sale, which was a good remedy here? Um, <coughs> a couple reasons. It said something about uh, she wouldn't be able to get the permit. Ah. Uh -huh. she was running. Um, no, 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 the trial court. Well, why the trial court think that position by sale would be a good idea? I think you were talking about the Supreme Court. Oh, wow, sorry. Okay. I guess that they said that it would be easier and oh, yeah. just to uh, stop off. Right. So it's always going to be easier in terms of less work to sell the property, right? Why is it so easy? You don't have to worry about dividing things up, dealing with all these competing property claims, all the garbage hauling. You order one sale, you chop up the total amount of money, right? And then you hand out a check to both parties, right? They also made a point that, you know, if you're gonna try and sell only part of it, you're not gonna get a very good price because so all this garbage hauling being done there. Right, but there's a problem with this uh, analysis, Tamara. What's what's lacking in the trial court's analysis? What what why is it the wrong perspective to say what will be easy? Why is that not the right way of looking at this? Yeah. So with respect to these joint tenancies, are courts supposed to be concerned about things like efficiency and what would generate the most money and revenue? No. That's what the court also is on appeal, right? Of course you can generate more money by nullifying this, this co-tenancy, right? Of course you can generate more efficiency by getting rid of this, this concurrent estate, but that's not their open inquiry, right? This is a valid tenancy in common. There's no problem with it, right? Ms. Valencius is acting lawfully. She has whatever permission to do her garbage business. She was grandfathered in, and they can't stop her. So what the trial court tried doing was saying, oh yeah, let's try and balance the equities, right? And you have this little old lady with her garbage business, and you have this entire other place that can build all these condos, right? You're gonna see this exact dynamic pop up a lot in property, more in property too where they try and balance the harm to one party versus the others. Remember that we did the nuisance case with the, yeah, the air conditioners? No, we didn't do nuisance. Okay, you'll do this nuisance case, I think that's next semester, right? a, main, a brain blip, where um, uh, it was actually a Houston apartment building that built this humongous air conditioner, right? It was known as like jumbo jet air conditioners to, to like chill an entire apartment building. They built this air conditioning at 15 feet from this other person's house. And the noise was so loud, they couldn't go outside, they couldn't do anything without this, you know, this huge noise, right? So the possible options were, they could install um, a central air conditioning unit, which would have been several hundred thousand dollars, or they could just bought out this old family and have them move out of, out of town, right? And what the court said was, they were here first, right? They were here first. The fact that you're bothering them is not our concern. And in this case, the court said, you spend your own money and fix your own air conditioning system, don't bother these people, right? And some of you think that's ridiculous, right? This one house, pay for them to move across the street, whatever, buy earplugs. But very often in property law, you focus on the burdens of people already there who are acting lawfully, okay? 
Good. Dell Web? Yes, yes. The feed lock the case. Air conditioner was blowing from a, no, it wasn't Dell Web. It was an air conditioner from a grocery store blowing stuff on the side. Probably the same idea. Yeah. yeah. So this is actually a very tort like concept, right? The tort analysis will say, you know, what's the benefit, what's the burden, right, of each side? But the property is one saying, like, no, 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 no. She's there first. Don't burden her. So, Harrison, how did the Court of Appeals handle this one? What did they do? <clears throat> they did not agree with the trial court. They, uh, Good. This one is only in the interest of the person with the larger share of the property. Um, so, I guess they reversed? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. They, they, they reversed. And they walk through the history of this idea, idea between the partition and the sale. And they effectively say that partitions are only ordered in the most rare of circumstances, right? We're not going to order partitions unless they really can't get along. And even then, we will definitely not order a sale unless it's like almost like an emergency where there's no, no means. And they focus on, what, on the thing called practicability, where someone said easiness, right? Just because it's easier, right, to sell it doesn't mean that's what the court should do. You have to look at the best interest of both parties. There's also the issue of what happens to Mrs. Valencia's livelihood. This was her business on this land. And it's not clear if they sold this property, could she maintain this business, right? It's not clear if she would be able to keep getting the permits or keep getting whatever else. So here, there could be a significant burden to her as a result of having to sell this land. So closing, in this case, it's a fairly easy situation to just subdivide and partition off her garbage business and let the rest of them come to be homes. All right, everyone see that case? Questions on that one? As it turns out in the aftermath, it didn't work out too well for Ms. Valencius. So because she had a partition, she effectively had now to have a garbage hauling business next to all these homes. So she actually had to pay money to the developers to compensate for this nuisance, right? Which is something to be, un I think it's a little bit unfair because she was there first and they built these homes next to her, right? So she kind of, they kind of came to the nuisance, but she had to pay all this money. And also because of the way they partitioned the land, she only had access to one of the roads and she couldn't get her trucks off the property as well. Um, so she, she would have made out much better. Had she held out and just sold the property, she would have made significantly more money. So this is a situation people don't know what's good for them, but still the courts say if she wants to stay there, she can stay there. Okay. All right. Questions? No? Okay. Um, there are a couple note cases afterwards which you might want to take a look at. There was the first one was um, this Arkland versus Harper. It was a West Virginia case. And this case, I think, proves the rule that just because you can make more money from selling a piece of land doesn't mean you should do it. And this was a case where there was all this um, coal mining to be had in some land, and they wanted to do a sale. And the court said no, right? There's sentimental value in property. And just because you might be able to make more money doesn't mean that a court should step in and order a sale. Okay. Uh, the other case is Johnson versus Hendrickson basically have the exact opposite, right? They ordered a sale if the value of the share of money, uh, I'm sorry, if each uh, co-tenant was, was uh, less more than the whole. Well, so that again, they effectively ordered this sale when the value of the total was greater than the sum of the parts. In other words, if the people can make more money by selling it than they could be holding on individual parts, the court in that case ordered a sale, right? So you see courts kind of go in different directions here. I don't know if that's just one uh, 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 solid rule, but generally speaking, it's hard to get a judicial sale order. Okay? Um, the, the book also discusses a phenomenon that's actually somewhat prevalent 
um, is that say someone dies and there has, you know, a, a, if they say a poor black farmer dies in test state with no will, and then some wealthy party goes and buys his interest in the land, right? Now he's a co-tenant. At that point, he can order Kodo Court and ask for a sale of the entire property, and he's the only one who can afford it. So by getting one share, you can force the sale and then buy the entire thing. And this is a rather unscrupulous method of uh, acquiring property on the cheap. And it, it, this does happen. All right. Questions? No? All right. Well, I take a look at the, um, uh, Jesse, uh, problem number seven, uh, example number seven on, uh, on question on page uh, 371. Want to read that one? What do you think happens there? A and B are heirs of their father who own one item, both A and B very much want the gold rocking chair. They cannot agree who is to have the chair. A brings a partition action, and what the should report the board. All right, what do you think here? You saw the chair in half? Um, <laughs> What, what do we do here? Uh, it was uh, an act of sale. Well, the, sa the chair is mostly sentimental value. Do you think it'll get much value? Uh, Probably not. Andrew, what do you think? What do you think you do here? Um, I mean, you have this rocking chair. They both want it. What do you do? You just see who, who it's worth the most. To ah, how, how do you do that? Auction, I guess. Auction between the brothers. Um, ah, which, whichever brother pays more for it. That's a little perverse, though. They both have a share to it. They're paying for something they already own. <laughs> Aaron, what do you think? Yeah. You're the judge. How do you resolve this one? Jason, what do you think? Order the destruction and see which one gives it up. Yes, this is Solomon, right? Everyone get the Solomon reference. Remember the story in the Bible where, 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 where King Solomon said, oh, no, that's my baby, and that's my baby. See, if they're Mori Povich, they've been the best way of resolving that, but they didn't have Mori back then. So, so the King Solomon says, okay, I'm going to cut the baby in half, and then you get one half, you get the other half. And one of the mothers was like, okay. And the other mother said, no, don't do it. And he said, okay, you're the mother because you don't want the destruction of the child. So. He, he suggests taking a buzz saw. It's like, all right, <laughs> who wants it? Right, but let, uh, Jordan, what's another solution that's perhaps not so uh, uh, violent? Um, I don't know. Oh, man. Alex, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do you make him share it? <laughs> Yes, yes, and that's actually what happened, right? The judge said, okay, one brother gets it for six months out of the year, the other brother gets it for the other six months out of the year. Genius, right? This is why we, none of us should ever be judges. We, <laughs> I order the church be sawed in half. Yeah, they, they share it. Now, which brother gets it first? I hope they flipped a coin or something. I don't even know. All right. It was like the Barry Bonds baseball case. You know, how do you get it? Sure. Okay. By the way, there was actually with the Barry Bonds baseball case, I think we did that a few weeks ago. Someone's actually, well, if, you, if we cut the ball in half, right? Well, that wouldn't do very good because that would destroy the value of the, uh, uh, of the property. Although, if I remember correctly, the guy who actually bought it at auction, wasn't it Mark Echo? And didn't he burn an asterisk in the ball? Someone Google that. Right. I'm pretty sure that uh, the designer, Mark Echo, purchased the Barry Bonds ball, and he actually had like a branding iron he put an asterisk on the Barry Boswell because of his steroid allegations. Is that, is that right? Yeah, pretty sure. If someone's up, a link about that, I can put it up there. But I'm pretty sure that happened. Okay. Other questions on the uh, on the rocking chair? Any other ideas of how to resolve that uh, dispute? Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good solution. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, the next case we do um, discusses how you actually use the land, okay? And again, we start from the premise that, oh, that's it. yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. 
Right. So we start from the premise that um, you need to give both tenants access to the entire property. And that, that, that makes a lot of sense when we're discussing, um, you know, a farm or a field. What happens when we're discussing like a warehouse? So, um, what was up to? Okay, so Chad, do you want to tell us what happened in um, uh, Spiller versus Macrith, please? Sure. Uh, the Spiller and Macrith owned a building together as tenants in common. Uh huh. And actually had uh, auto rights to rent the building. We uh, ended the lease, moved out, and uh, took all the lots off. So that's why. Spiller put new locks on there and began using it as, as a warehouse. Uh, Mackett didn't like that, so he sent him a letter saying he needed to either make half of the warehouse or start paying half of the rent. Okay, good. All right, so here we have a situation where we're not talking about a farm or a field. Oh, by the way, this is the sewer, yeah? So he actually um, branded the ball with an asterisk because of the steroid use. And I believe the Hall of Fame would not take it because it became a loan rather than a gift. Anyway, you can read that story later if you like. <clears throat> so in the Spiller case, what happened? Okay, you have these two guys, right? And they were, they, were, they were tenants in common. And they had a warehouse. So we're not talking about a field. We're talking about an actual building on top of a warehouse. And they previously had some sort of a tenant who was leasing it. And that, that tenant vacated. One of the guys, Spillers, entered, and he started using it as a warehouse to stall stuff, okay? And the facts do suggest that he did put locks on the door, okay? The other tenant wasn't too happy about this. He said, hey, wait a minute. This isn't fair that you're now using this property as a warehouse and generating all this revenue where I'm getting nothing. In the past, the tenant paid us money, which we split. Now, not only are you not getting any rent money, you're profiting off of this because you're not having this business, right? So the question in this case was, can the non-occupying tenant force the other tenant to pay rent, right? So um, first, um, let's see, uh, Justin, <clears throat> generally speaking, if you have co-tenants and you agree to have a, of a lessee on the property, how is the rent accounted for? Someone's leasing a property from co-tenants, how's the rent accounted for? I guess you split, are you talking about the rent that the lessee pays? Yeah, yeah. Split. good, good. So generally speaking, they can split it. They don't have to. And we see that in the next case, right, with the, with, with the, uh, the boxing pavilion, right, where tenants usually are required to split rent, but they might not always do it, okay? So here they did have rent and they did have it split, and there wasn't really an issue there. But when the tenant vacates, what happens, right? Ravi, is there any obligation for two tenants to ever pay each other rent? No. Oh, well, I, I guess the situation is if the claim of the ousting, like if one prevents the other person from entering or stops from entering, they use the property. Okay, that's right. That's right. Sorry, and I didn't mean to distract, but this is actually the baseball. And he actually carved into the hide of the ball an asterisk. Remember what I mean by asterisk? Like whenever there's a record and there's some like speculation whether there's a deserved record, put like an asterisk next to it. They're trying to say that he didn't really deserve this ball. Okay. So generally speaking, two tenants have no obligation to pay each other rent. They don't. Ravi said correctly that one of the few circumstances where rent is appropriate, right, is where they have some sort of ouster. Okay. Gary, what what's this mean, ouster? What does this word mean, ouster? Um, the papers said that it refers to the beginning of the run of the statute of limitations. Well, I mean, that's one application. What does the word ouster mean? Basically, it's someone who's trying to get the other petitioner to pay or get out. What, what does the word ouster mean? I mean, those those are conclusions of ouster, but what does the word ouster mean? Probably someone who's trying to get out or rearrange the arrangement for a rent. Uh, close, Summer. What, what does what's the ouster mean? I think it means you're claiming possession of the property, but you're putting the liability the rent on the other person. Okay. Like, you're, 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 you
your... Uh, nothing to do with rent. Just in general, what's the word ouster mean? You're, you're getting too far into the weeds. What? I can't hear. The other person's right to what does what, what does it mean to ouster someone? Oh. <laughs> really simple definition. It, it means to kick out. <laughs> yeah, you guys are going way farther than I want for now, right? Ouster means to kick out. Right? To oust, to throw away, ouster means to kick out. And, and Gary, you're exactly right. We discuss ouster in the context of adverse possession, right? And, and Gary, back to you. With adverse possession, what does it mean to oust someone? What, what does, what's the effect of ouster with adverse possession? Um, you're, you're just, I mean, the other no, I'm talking about adverse possession. Okay. Well, generally speaking, right, if you want to start engaging in adverse possession, if you want to start squatting somewhere, right, you need to actually throw the bum out. You need to actually throw the previous tenant out, and you assert that you are now on the piece of land, right? Ouster is an important concept because it signifies that you are now the owner, okay? So in the context of co-tenancies, right, in the context of co-tenancies, ouster means that you effectively kicked out your co-tenant. And the court goes back and forth to try and say how much has to happen in order for there to be ouster, right? Um, so, so Troy, how does the court figure out how much one tenant has to do to the other tenant in order for it to constitute ouster? <laughs> According to the case, how much effort, how much work, or how, what must a, one tenant do in order to oust the other tenant? What must actually have to happen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. So, one of the core elements of ouster is what they call "quote absolute ownership," right? Where one of the tenants must assert absolute ownership of the other. Okay. And historically, this would mean something like putting up a fence or putting up a gate and blocking access to the other tenant. Okay. Is it is it enough here, Meredith? Is it enough that they put locks in the door? Was that sufficient for ouster here? No. no why not? Good. But. Did, did the other tenant ever ask for a key to the lock? No. Right, and that's an important factor, right? The mere fact that you put locks in a door it was in Birmingham, um, thank you, in Tuscaloosa, that means you don't want the stuff to get stolen, right? You're not trying to expel or kick away the other tenant, okay? Also, at any point, Adriana, did the, did the other tenant ever ask to enter the property? No. That's right. He never actually asked to enter. He was trying to get a quick buck, right? He was trying to say, oh, wait a minute. I'm using this land without permission, that means I should get something for it, right? So in the end, the court found that there was no actual ouster, right? Um, and Samantha, if there's no ouster, is there any obligation for one tenant to pay rent to the other? Even if the other tenant's making all this money from his warehousing business. <coughs> So then what what is there any remedy for the uh, for the non occupying tenant? <coughs> I'm sorry, say it again? Yes. So this is what we mean when we say a separate but undivided interest, right? You have a complete right to use a property however you want, and you're limited, it can't be injurious to the other party. But there's really nothing here that's, that's, that's causing any injury, right? The only thing, the only possible harm being uh, suffered is that he's not making any money from this warehouse. And this is not sufficient, right? So the tenancy in common, in this case, remains. <coughs> and no rent is awarded.
Okay. Questions in this case? Not too hard, right? Any questions? Say you had to send a letter that said, hey, I want, I want to occupy this building equally with you. Uh -huh. Does he at that if he's denied, does he share the money at that point? Well, let's ask like this, right? What if in the warehouse there's this huge pile of boxes? Like, you know what? I want to stand right there. I want to stand where the pile of boxes is, and I can't because there's a pile of boxes there. You are denying me access to part of the factory. What happens then? Then that is uh, absolute ownership. Exactly. So this is where this is where this doctrine actually gets a little messy, right? If you want to be really technical, and you have a warehouse, just imagine a huge room, and in one corner. You have a stack of boxes, and you know what? I want to stand right there. You are blocking my access from standing in this corner of boxes. Therefore, I want rent. So the mistake this guy made, in my opinion, is that he sent this letter with a demand for rent without ever actually trying to enter. Had he entered, said, oh man, I want to stand there. I want to walk around there. I want to take a seat over there. I want to enjoy that place. Mm -hmm. But there are all these boxes everywhere. I can't do it. I think the case would come out a little bit differently. But the mere fact they never even attempted to enter, never attempted to get past the locks, means there was really no claim for ouster. I think the judge would probably just throw you out for wasting his time if you run the game and say, you know, one stay in a really box store. Really have no true claim. Well, I, I don't think so. What if the entire warehouse was boxes floor to ceiling and there was just like a little path to walk along, right? Can you meaningfully do anything on that property? Can you enjoy that property? Right? So it, it's not that crazy, right? When you have two people using a piece of property and one person fills the entire warehouse with boxes, you can't do anything there. I was being a little bit glib with, you know, <laughs> with, with Calvin's Cal Cal example that's standing over there. But I'm trying to illustrate the point that if the space is filled with stuff, you can't do stuff there. And that diminishes your ability to enjoy the property. I was. Never mind. I'm not pretty much clear. What if Makarov had wanted to bring his tenants back? So I'm sorry, say it again. What if Makarov had said, I don't want to use this for the warehouse anymore, I want to bring a tenant in? Okay, so now you got a situation the parties don't agree of what to do, right? One tenant wants to keep his own junk there because it's free, and the other tenant wants to bring in a tenant, and you know, the other co tenant wants to bring in a lessee. Who can pay rent to both of them? Um, they would probably have to go to court, and the court would say, "Get out of here! I don't care." But between the two of them, if he in fact is using the land in a way that's injurious to the other party, he would probably get a get a judgment. Because if he wants to rent this and he can't do it because of all this junk everywhere, that's actually harming the co-tenancy together, right? Um, but courts don't like getting involved. And this might be actually a case where, like the um, Delfino's case, you know, where they have to effectively, they can't section off part of a warehouse, right? It's in downtown Tuscaloosa. So they probably have to order a sale if they can't get along. Okay. Other thoughts on this case? This is why having a easy. And if two parties don't get along, it gets very messy because people just don't agree of how to use their own land. Quite important. Uh, initially, say to resolve this. Are you saying if they will sort of resolve this among themselves and maybe mediate or something like that? Right? So yes. The next step is that you resolve the resolve uh, yeah. the steps. Yeah, I, th I think that that's the right path, Eddie. I think what would happen is if they go to a judge, they'll say, you know what? Go mediate this. Go get an arbitrator, and if you cannot work this out, come back with me, and, and then we can talk about a sale. But the sale is really the last resort. Why? Because the guy running his warehouse is fine. He doesn't want to change anything. He's happy with how the things are managed. The other guy is not. Okay. What else? Like so, if you're leasing, or if you own a condominium with two people, or just even another person, and you want to. One person wants to rent it like for a month, and you want to occupy it for that month. How would that? Or is that just a bit of a I mean, if you are joint tenants, or if you are tenants in common, 
then you figure out how to do it best for yourself. I mean, presumably, if one person's living there, that'll probably take precedence of renting it out. Whereas here, it's a commercial enterprise, which is slightly different. <clears throat> what else? Yeah, very good questions. You, you see the difficulty and why the courts don't want to have to deal with this kind of garbage, right? Because these are, these are roommate squabbles after a certain point. All right, let's do the other case. Uh, Cassandra, what happened? What happened in uh, Schwarzbach? Uh -huh. <clears throat> they were they were joint co tenants. Joint tenant, yeah. Just and I, I don't mean to, to, to don't say if you want to say a tenants in common, you can say call them co tenants. I'm okay with that. But if it's a joint tenancy, just say joint tenancy so you don't confuse yourself. And I promise you, do not say joint tenants in common. Someone will try saying that, and you confuse the heck out of yourself. So you're right. They, they were joint tenants. I'm sorry to interrupt. Please, go ahead. So she decided that she didn't want to be a tenant, but her husband wants to collect rent. Good. Thank you. That's right. So here we have a case. It's actually from Orange County, California, where it's actually the current site of the what tell they call them the Los Angeles Angels of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, whatever they're called. I can't keep track of what they're called, but um, now they're called the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Anaheim is not in Los Angeles, but but whatever. And you had a husband and wife, and they were joint tenants on a piece of land. And uh, it seemed that the husband was actually quite old and didn't seem to have all his senses together. <laughs> And you have some boxing promoter come along and said, hey, I want to build a boxing pavilion on your land. And uh, the wife was like, no way, not going to do this, not going to sign. So she kind of runs away when they're doing all the papers. Like, not not going to sign this. And the husband signs for it anyway. And then the uh, the guy starts clearing uh, the various almond trees and builds this, this boxing ring, right? So this is effectively the question you asked me a moment ago, right? <coughs> what happens when one party wants to do something on a piece of jointly owned land, and the other party says, absolutely not. She says, I don't want no boxing ring. That'll be followed by liquor and women, right? <laughs> I love that line. So, uh, you know, what, what do you do here, right? So at the outset, um, Jacqueline, this might actually surprise you. Is there any requirement that both of the joint tenants agree to leasing out the land? No, there's not. How come? Um, well, they're talking about the role of possession and that because they each have possession over the property, but one of the tenants can assert his right of possession and his job. Yeah. So this is actually somewhat counterintuitive, right? I said this over and over again, but each tenant has a separate but undivided interest in the land. When I say undivided, I mean undivided. And they can lease out the entire piece of property without the other one's consent. This is why I don't want you to eat 50 50, right? It's not 50 50 until they sell it. <clears throat> if they want to lease it out, they can actually lease out the entire property. And there's no requirement to get the other one's permission, right? But actually, what's the problem of? of only getting one of the joint tenants' permission to lease out the entire land or lease a part of it. Well, I mean, what if they wanted to use that part of the land? And, um, I mean, they could even assert that it was injurious to them and they were uh, infringing their rights to that part of the property since they have the right, right. to the as well. Exactly, right? So you take a risk, right? You take a risk. By signing the lease only with one of the parties, you are getting, yes, a legal claim to the entirety of the land. There's no dispute about that legally. But if the other co-tenant finds that she's been denied possession or denied access to the uh, to the boxing, right? You've now put yourself in a tough spot because at that point, she can go to court and say, 
hey, I want rent from him, or I want to order a petition in kind, or I want to order a petition in sale. So then your claim is done. You've now just been ex uh, evicted. You've been ejected from the land. So there's a risk from both selling land and buying a share where only one of the tenant agrees to it. Right? But that's not what happened here. Right? So the husband signs this lease, and this other guy starts building this boxing pavilion, right? Um, Allison, what does what does the wife want now? Okay, so how can she get this lease destroyed? What what would have to happen for the lease to be destroyed? Okay, good. There would have to be some sort of actual ouster, right? Pretend this is a boxer ring, it's not, but just pretend, right? She would have to try and come here and be kicked out, right? And I mean, we can be super technical here, right? Does she have to buy a ticket to the boxing games? What if they charge her admission? Would that be an ouster? What happens if she wanted to enter into, you know, the men's locker room? Because I don't know, that was her property, right? I'm being really pedantic here, but if we take seriously as courts do this idea that She's accessing the entire of the property. If she's kept out of one part of the boxing ring on her land, she was just ousted, right? So what would happen then if you were, if Brian, if you were ousted, what would the proper remedy be? Uh, if she was, if there was ouster? Yes, yeah, she, she was not able to enter the men's room. Well, then they would have to, she would suffer injury and they'd have to pay her a remedy, right? I mean, rent, she gets rent anyways just because they're on that land. What's the... Was she getting was she getting the rent initially? No, she wasn't. But doesn't she have isn't there a claim for that? Well, that's what that right. So she was not able to get the lease nullified. So what did she get instead? She got rent. Yeah. Good, right? So she was actually able to get rent for this, and because she was able to get rent, <clears throat> that that gives them the right to perhaps not keep her on part of the land, right? So they don't need to order a petition uh, by sale. Is it relevant whether? If you have two parties, one willingly and agrees to accept the rent, and the other one doesn't, does that in any way affect their claims? Well, that's exactly what happened. The husband screwed over the wife, right? Okay. The husband tried to get around the wife's permission. Um, but as we said a minute ago, it doesn't. You can have one you can collect joint tenant who makes all these wheels, wheels, and dealings, right? So you, she can get rent only if there's an officer, or just because. Until she's actually deprived some access to her property, there's no grounds to give her any rent. Right? What else? Let me ask you a, a, another question. Um, uh, Eric, what happens if there's a joint tenancy, right? You're talking about the four unities, right? Does writing a new lease sever any of those unities? Probably does. Does it? Think about it. These two people own a joint tenancy in fee simple, right? They've now given a leasehold to um, to one of the uh, to this guy with the boxing ring, right? Did the both husband wife acquire at the same time? Did that change? Did their title? Did they have a different instrument change? It's actually the same. Did their interest remain the same though? The duration, yes. Uh, well, think about it. Before this, they had fee simple, right? Mm -hmm. What is their estate now that they've given this leasehold? I'm not going to have the right of possession for however long, but that is a. Right. So, if you want to be really technical, courts have not taken this path, but in theory, right, they've severed one of the unities, right? Their interest has now been diminished. They had fee simple. And now that fee simple subject to this leasehold for whatever period of time. Right? Christian, what about putting a mortgage on a piece of land? This happens actually here on the group. What happens if one of the joint tenants puts a mortgage for his benefit alone on a piece of land? Think that would sever the unities? Well, that's an even that's probably a harder case because with a mortgage, you're not actually affecting your interest, you're simply putting a lien on top of the land. So what often happens, we'll do this when we do the marital property next week, is that the husband behind the wife's back puts a mortgage in the property, and whoopsie, he defaults. 
and the house gets foreclosed. And then they go after the property. We'll do cases like that next week. But generally speaking, joint tenants, so long as they don't diminish their interest or, or deny possession, the joint tenancy remains going strong. All right, questions on this? Nothing? All right. Uh, that's all I got. Have a, uh, have a wonderful long weekend. I'll see you next Wednesday.